Shabbat Shalom, everybody. This is Rabbi Shmuel, Rabbi Stephen Washby, Rabbi Shmuel Ben Yoshua. All right, hope you're doing well. And um, here we go, starting a whole new Torah reading, Torah sequence. So we just had the high holidays. Hope you're doing well. Hope you enjoyed them as much as I do. And, you know, maybe some of you are reacting to my word enjoy. But for me, the high holidays are, uh, I look forward to them. It, it's, for me, it's nice. You know, it's a time to be real spiritual. You know, we get into that seventh month, you know, like we do Shabbat on the seventh day of the week. We do our high holidays on the seventh day, seventh month of the year. And it's such a, a, a time when we really, you know, look at ourselves and get very introspective. And we really get close to Hashem. Uh, and we pledge to become better people, give thanks for the year we just had. And then there's the Jewish Thanksgiving, which is Sukkot, the individual audience that our people Israel has with Hashem on Shemini Yitzhak. And we take joy in our Torah and God's law with Simchat Torah. Uh, we have a new month coming up and uh, that's our cycle. That's our month. Very, very busy month. So when I say enjoy, let me rephrase that and say, I hope it was very meaningful for you. One of my goal as the rabbi is, you know, to make it that way, make it inspirational, to give you things to think about, but in a very good way, to feel good about yourself and feel good about your relationship with God and feel good about your life and where you're going. That is really, I think, what the high holidays are all about. So here we start. We've already started 5783. And now we start a whole new sequence of reading the Torah. We have taken the scrolls, we've rolled them to the beginning, and now we start reading again. In conservative Judaism, we are using the triennial cycle, which means we read a third of each portion each week instead of the whole thing. 5783 is triennial year one. We will be reading the first third of each Parsha as we proceed through our journey through, through God's teaching. And we go to Genesis, the creation. Triennial year one is, and typically, you know, there's seven Aliyot plus the Moth here. And it's typically the first three Aliyah. Second year is the next three, and then it's the last two or last three. You know, however, uh, however they divide it, it's not an exact science. They do it so that when you're reading each, each triennial portion, that it's kind of a complete thought. It's not like, like, for example, if the Song of the Sea, for example, that's a long reading, and they don't divide that up because you want to read the whole thing, right? So it may, you're, you're reading for that particular portion, which, you know, happens to be Jethro. I kind of know that. Um, your, your reading might be longer than, say, other readings because you're including that, and you know that's kind of an extensive reading. So in this case, we are in Genesis again. We uh, are reading actually the first three Eliot, and the triennial reading is set up to be the first chapter and the first couple of verses of the second chapter, which is creation and Shabbat. Now, I'm going to talk about that in a minute, but let's talk about another concept that uh, my wife, the Rebbitson, kind of enjoyed. And that is, and we're going a little bit beyond this year's part of, of the Parsha of Genesis. It talks about how Hashem gave Adam a companion and a helper. So what does that mean, helper? How does that apply? People say, well, you know, a wife is there to help help the man, okay? But what? You know, there's different ways to look at that. But if you look at the art scroll Chumash, they basically discuss the relationship between a man and a wife, and the role of the wife in the relationship is to basically be the sounding board or the check on the man. So I've gotten into discussions as to why some of the commandments are written so that they apply to the man. Case in point, kids hold your ears. 
In Leviticus chapter 18, we have that infamous verse, man shall not lay with man, it is an abomination. So if you happen to be a little bit of a woman's liver, and <laughs> we've known some people, and I uh, just want to give a shout out to our, our dear friend, Sherry Reeder, who passed away a few years ago, but you know, she's still in our hearts, and uh, she comes to mind because we'd have these discussions, and her birthday <clears throat> was a few weeks ago. But according to her, there's nothing wrong with a woman laying with a woman. Well, <laughs> here's the analysis from the talk because they talk about that. The Talmud recognizes that men have a lot more lustful urges than women. Do. Now, this is not a hard and fast rule, so you know we know this, but in general, it's men. I mean, if you look at the media, you know who is it that's getting in trouble for sexual innuendos and inappropriate behavior? It's not women, it's men, right? So men are the ones that have a hard time checking their behavior. So it's men really that are the ones that are more at the mercy of these urges than women. And that's why some of these commandments are addressed to men and not women. Women are considered to be on a higher spiritual plane because they're not at the mercy of, of these urges. You know, they don't have the same type of urges, if you will, than that men do. They're more in control and it's more subdued with them. So that's why it's addressed to men. So this is part of, part of, not the only, but part of the role of the woman to keep men in balance. For a case in point, during the golden calf situation, right? That's what we're going to see when we come to Exodus. Moses goes up to Mount Sinai. He's getting the Ten Commandments. He comes down. People are building a golden calf. You know, people... Uh, basically pay for their um, offense with their lives. But it is also said that a lot of the women went to the men and said, what are you doing? This is absurd. Going forward to numbers, when they talk about the revolution, the revolt, that Korah and Dathan and Abiram tried to instill against Moses, there is a name that's not mentioned, and I'm sorry, but, my, but his name escapes me, that is mentioned as being part of that revolt, and then he's not mentioned anymore. People say, well, what happened to him? Well, basically, his wife talks some sense into him. She said, okay, so Korah overthrows Moses' leader, and now he, and now he, or an Aaron, and now he's the Kohen Gadol. You're still going to be a flunky Levi. You haven't gained anything, except God's going to be pretty pissed at you for, for doing the revolt. So come home and forget this nonsense. And she basically saved his life. All stems from this one verse that says that a woman should be a helper of man. That's part of it. And of course, you know, men and women are um, kind of two halves of the same whole. Men go out, they work, they're more physically strong, women are more emotionally strong. So they stay at home and they take care of the, ki the kids, they take care of the house, they instill the values, et cetera, et cetera. In my Devar Torah, I bring up a point that uh, it's one of my favorite points of, of the Torah. And that is that when we look at the days of creation, okay, it says day, but what is a day? We now have two concepts of the word day. Day could mean that 24 or 23 hour, what is it, 57 and a half minute cycle for the earth to rotate and get back to the same point facing the sun that it did before, right? It's, you know, the rotation. That's a day, 24 hour, 23 and whatever cycle. A day can also mean the daylight as opposed to the night. So perhaps day here really kind of means a period. And it was later, the concept of day was later brought down to the fact that we just use for these two things. But a day can mean uh, just a period of time. So if the first day was the day when God created the universe, to me, that's the Big Bang Theory. And that could have happened in micro, milli, what's what, nanoseconds? Bam, and there it is. There you go. You got your universe. The second day was when the, you know, all the chaos became order. The firmament started to get firm. You know, uh, we started to see more shapes in the universe. That could have taken billions of years. That was more of an epoch. 
day can be an epoch. It could just mean that one that a period of time. See? So each day didn't necessarily be exactly the same time. And as was argued in the play, if you've heard it or read it or seen the movie Inherit the Wind, you know, the Scopes Monkey trial, when the lawyer says to him, was there a sun and a moon? No. Then how do you know, really know what exactly how long of a day was, right? So there it is. And again, in my mind, there's no distinction between religion and science here. Religion reflects science. Science reflects religion. Religion, we just give sort of a personal a, a personalization to it, sort of an anthropomorphism in that we recognize that it's Hashem that was the prime move. Okay, so take a break. Relax. We're over the high holidays. Next coming up is Hanukkah, but you got some time, so enjoy. Um, look forward to seeing you in services. As usual, thank you for listening, and Shabbat Shalom.